There are times when the world seems wide and inviting, and others when it seems narrow and forbidding. Aging, illness, death keep closing in and closing in. We seem to have fewer and fewer choices, fewer and fewer options. But the important thing is not to let our minds get hemmed in by the world. We have to make them bigger than the world. After all, what does the world have to offer? Material gain, material loss. Status, loss of status. Praise, criticism, pleasure, pain. No real food for the mind there. Yet for a lot of people, that's what life is all about. And if you make that what your life is all about, then when the world closes in, the mind seems squeezed. That was one of Forrester John's definitions of dukkha, or stress, is what puts a squeeze on the heart. As long as our aspirations are defined what the world, by what the world has to offer, it's going to put that squeeze on us. So we have to learn to look around, expand our horizons. Think about the Buddha. He was a very large-hearted person. He was in a position where, when he was still a prince, the world was wide open before him, all kinds of things he could do. And he still saw that it wasn't big enough. It was that aspiration to find something bigger, something that didn't offer the prospect of aging, illness, and death, that wasn't going to come in and destroy whatever happiness he tried to build. He allowed himself to imagine that. Then he realized if it were a possibility, and he hadn't pursued that possibility, his life would have been a waste. And so he pursued it, and he found happiness, true happiness. He spent the rest of his life telling people that they could do it too. He established the teachings that have lasted now 2,600 years saying that that option is still available to us. So it's important that we allow it to expand our imaginations, expand our ideas of what's possible, so that our hearts can be bigger than the world as well. We do this by developing the perfections. It's the perfections are qualities you develop in the mind, and when they're encased in the mind or in the mind is imbued with them. Then even when you grow ill, even when you're old, even when you die, they're not destroyed. They carry on, they carry on. And they give you a perspective that allows you to see beyond the confines of your immediate surroundings. Because the world has its ups and downs. You have your successes and your failures in terms of what the world has to offer. But you realize that the work you put in to develop these perfections, even when things don't come out as you want in terms of what the world has to offer, you still got something of value inside. After all, we all have our past karma, which is going to place some limitations on us in terms of the situations that are available to us. But we also have our present karma, the decisions we're making right now, and those offer us an element of freedom, which is why no matter what the circumstances are around you, you can still develop the perfections. And they all contribute to keeping that larger perspective. They fall into four categories, those related to discernment, those related to truth those related to relinquishment, and those related to calm. These are the qualities of any good determination. And that's what you have to do in order to get your heart larger. You have to determine on that, because otherwise you let yourself 
get defined by what other people want out of you, what they expect of you. If you just go along with the flow, well, you know what happens with water when it flows? It flows downhill. If you want to go up against the stream, it requires determination. So you start out with discernment, the discernment that sees that it is possible. If you're going to solve the problem of suffering, to solve it from within. That's work that you can, you can do in any circumstances. After all, it is your craving and your clinging. The clinging is the suffering, the craving is the cause of suffering. You can't pin the blame on things outside. Of course, the Buddha never talks about blame so much, just talking about where you're going to focus your efforts. You focus them inside. But you keep in mind the possibility they're focused inside. As John Lee says, before you make yourself large, you have to make yourself really small. They're focused inside what's happening right here with the breath at the mind. What's happening in the mind right at the breath. Looking at the details, because the details are the things that grow into larger things. You're making your choices, that present karma where you have the freedom of choice. It's made right here. So you want to see this point right here really clearly. Once this point is understood, that's when things open up, as John Lee's as John Lee would put it, he said, things explode beyond the world. There's a dimension that's not confined by the things fabricated by the world or fabricated by your mind. And discernment is what's going to see that possibility before it actually sees it and holds it as a working hypothesis, something you have confidence in. And you allow that to define your idea of what's going to be important. Now, together with discernment, there's goodwill. It begins with goodwill for yourself. Because you really do want to take your happiness seriously. But if you're going to take it seriously, you have to think about the happiness of others, too. Because if your happiness depends on their suffering, it's not going to last. So here again, you have to expand your awareness. Take into consideration the well-being of other beings, other people. I've heard goodwill defined as non-judgmental awareness. It's not really the case. It's not exclusive. And it's not just awareness. It's a determination. You're determined to keep your attitude that may all beings be happy. But you do exert judgment in the sense that you realize that if beings are going to be happy, it's going to have to depend on their actions. You know, saying, well, may you be happy whatever you're doing. As the Buddha said, may no one deceive anyone, may no one despise anyone, or through irritation wish for anyone to suffer. In other words, may other beings have goodwill too, act on goodwill as well. Now the question, will they do that? It's beyond your power. But you want to make sure that your intentions in dealing with others are informed by that determination. Then the perfections are relate to truth. There's truth in and of itself. Or once you've made up your mind that you're going to do this, you stick with it. And you hold to that truth, regardless of what the world thinks, and regardless of whether it's convenient in terms of the world. You have a larger truth that you're holding to. You truly do want a genuine happiness. And so you realize there are things you've got to give up. This is where virtue comes in. You abstain from behavior that's going to harm yourself and harm others. And also persistence, where you work to get rid of unskillful qualities and you work to give rise to them. 
you focus your desires there. And again, measuring the skill of your actions, not so much in terms of worldly success, but in terms of who's harmed. You want to make sure that nobody's harmed. You're taking responsibility for your actions. You're not saying, well, if people are nice to me, I'll be nice to them. I'll be nice to them only if they're nice to me. And say, regardless of how they treat me, I'm going to be skillful in my dealings with them. So again, you don't let yourself be limited by the circumstances around you. And as the Buddha said, if you realize that you would have to suffer in terms of your health, in terms of your relatives, in terms of your wealth, by holding to the precepts, you're willing to suffer those losses because they're minor compared to a loss in virtue. Of course, virtue comes from where? It comes from the mind. So you're working on your intentions. That's where the qualities, skillful qualities and unskillful qualities are going to show themselves. So that's your focus. That leads into the next set of perfections which have to do with relinquishment, basically generosity and renunciation. You regard your material wealth as a tool for building the perfections. Not something to be enjoyed so much in and of itself. You do enjoy your wealth to some extent, but you realize you can't just waste it all that way. You invest it in developing good qualities of the mind and being generous. And this applies not only to material wealth, but also to your knowledge, to your energy, to your forgiveness of others. These are the ways you can be generous at all times, regardless of what your material circumstances are. And then there's renunciation. We realize that you don't want your happiness to have to depend on sensual pleasures being a certain way. And you look for pleasure inside in terms of the concentration that you can develop. We hear the word renunciation, and it sounds like deprivation. But it's simply you're renouncing a particular level of happiness because you want something higher. It's a trade up. As we're sitting here meditating, we're engaging in renunciation. We could be thinking about tomorrow's meal or tomorrow's pleasure or tomorrow's place to go traveling, or where I'd like to go if we could. But given the restrictions that are placed on us right now, you realize okay, that's a pretty futile place to look for happiness. Whereas the field inside the mind is wide open, huge unexplored territory for a lot of us. What can be done in terms of the breath? What can be done in terms of getting the mind to settle in and be undisturbed? With a sense of fullness, with a sense of refreshment. So think in renunciation in a positive light. It's not deprivation. It's a trade, just like generosity is a trade. Now you do this training for the sake of calm. That's the last set of perfections, basically endurance and equanimity. The Buddha talks about endurance. He talks about it in conjunction with goodwill. In other words, you're willing to endure other people's unskillful behavior. You're not going to react, and you're not going to let yourself get upset by it. That's goodwill for yourself. In other words, it's trying to make your goodwill as big as the earth, as wide as the river Ganges, as all-encompassing as space. So that no matter what happens, you tell yourself, I'm big enough to take that. As for equanimity, you're aiming at the equanimity that comes from true happiness.
But to get there, you have to develop first the equanimity that reminds you to be non-reactive. When things go well and things don't go well. But then to look for a deeper source of equanimity inside with the concentration. There's a very subtle pleasure. The Buddha talks about the, the pleasure of pleasure and the pleasure of equanimity. And he says the pleasure of equanimity is more refined. So it's not like you're eating tasteless gruel. It's just that you're learning to get more sophisticated in your sense of what true happiness for the mind is like when it's totally undisturbed. But even that lack of disturbance is not the goal. It's part of the path. When the mind is undisturbed, you can see very clearly what's going on inside. And this takes you back to your discernment. So what you've taken on as a working hypothesis becomes clear as you see what's happening in the mind, where the mind grabs onto things, clings to them, thinking that it's going to find happiness. And in the course of its search for happiness in that way, it's making more suffering. You see that, and you can let it go, because you're in a position of strength. And when the letting go is all around, that's when you find there is a dimension that is bigger than the world. The unfabricated is totally unlimited. And you found it by not letting the world squeeze you confine you, define what your aspiration should be. So take the Buddha's example. Make your heart larger than the world, and then work on b building these perfections into it so that you can take what in the beginning is an act of the imagination and use it to discover the reality. Because the path is one of those truths that becomes true because you believe in it and act on it. You're not going to find this just by sitting around and being non-reactive or trying to clone awakening. You work. There's work to be done, but it's good work. It's work that teaches you lessons about the mind and teaches you what's possible and what's not possible. And you find that what's possible as you look inside, is far larger than what's possible when you're looking for happiness outside. So try to enlarge your heart. And don't let the world keep you penned in. <laughs>